Okay, right. Thank you very much. Um, now, to carry on lots of the things that Leonard was just saying, except differently and less insightfully, this, the start of this, this the reason that there are these two uh, logos up there is uh, on a conversation I had, maybe it was at EAA last year, it was a suggestion that the people that German archaeologists think they should talk to to then influence politicians are other archaeologists, are the archaeologists working for uh, government at the uh, regional land level. And I thought, to me, thinking from a, a UK perspective, no, no, that would not happen in, in the UK. British archaeologists would not speak to the, to the local government archaeologist. The local government archaeologists, I'm scanning the room just in case there's any sneaked in. Um, uh, they, they work for their, their municipal authority. They work for the city or the county. They are, they are really quite low-level local government employees, and their job is to advise the planners, and then the planners, who are also local government employees, speak to the elected representatives who make a decision. They do not have any kind of position in influencing or subverting the democratic process. <laughs> so I'm then thinking about so the paper is, is the idea of thinking about who, who is and who can be influential archaeologists. Yeah, we should stop talking to archaeologists. I think this is exact, exactly what we should stop talking amongst ourselves. So half of my paper is, it was already presented with the one or two little snippets of what Leonard just said. But the, so it's thinking about the idea that there are different ways to, to do things. There are different contexts and that I think a lot of these are very culturally specific. What might be right and appropriate in Germany is not necessarily appropriate in UK or anywhere else. Okay. This is thinking about uh, approaches to, to changing minds. It's thinking about lobbying and it's thinking about advocacy. And the idea that any, any efforts to change minds, uh, there, there are two routes. There is either you're taking an um, active route of essentially um, getting into a place where you can actively form and shape policy before it's put into place, or reactively. And my down in front of the bulldozers, as Arthur Dent and Rescue British Archaeological Trust would do in an attempt too late to change something that's already been decided. I think that there is, there is headline grabbing value in reactive behavior but I really don't think it is actually very useful when it comes to changing policies, when it comes to changing what will happen. So then, yeah, moving on from thinking just in the simplest way about activeness and reactiveness, to think about lobbying and advocacy as two different strands to the way of doing things. And what I, the way that I see lobbying and advocacy as being different. Now, they don't just fit neatly into those active and reactive cartons, but they do they become quite close to it. It also made me think a little bit about the nature of the words in so there's a quick digression into cultural studies, but the semiotics, the words lobbying and advocacy. In, let's say in French, uh, lobbying is the pression. It's about pressure. And advocacy is uh, page YA. To plead, it is it is much it is much more. It tries to come across as being a much softer a way to do things. As you see from that photograph of, of on on the spot advocates behaving, it doesn't always have to be soft. Its advocacy does have value when it is grassroots and when it is spontaneous, when it is authentic. It does help to convince people, change people's minds. But lobbying is more technical. Lobbying requires a, a different kind of investment in order for it to be effective. And actually, I am much more interested in, in lobbying. And so that's what the rest of the paper is going to be thinking about. So I'm thinking of three different models for, for lobbying. And first, Technocratic. This is about how the how one can influence the, the, the European institutions. I spoke about this uh, at EAA a couple of years ago. Uh, thinking, talking about that, that there is a route 
to approach the European Commission. There, it is it is a formal route. It is only formal lobbyists, only people who have signed the European Transparency Register or organisations that have signed that, have the opportunity to have access to European uh, uh, European <coughs> Parliament and Council and the European Commission to try to guide, to advise the Commission on what should we put, put into uh, material. Now, of course, the, I'm not, I'm certainly not in a position to say that the European Commission is some sort of undemocratic uh, mechanism. The, these materials will ultimately be subject to democratic process. But this is the way, this is the only way to influence things at the European level. But it is, it is the model, it is the model that works there. It, it works at, it is in, in theory works, it does work at the European level. But then there are different models of ways to try to change minds. Now, this one I'm calling accountability. This is, this is thinking about the, um, this is thinking about the, the, the wonderful and well-intentioned EU, uh, the EAA, European Benchmarking Exercise. Uh, which we've been talking about in recent days, and I think possibly maybe later in this session too. It's, it is lovely, the idea of, of presenting benchmarks to the politicians to say this here, what are you going to do about this, this, and this, and we'll report what you said you would do, and we'll come back in five years' time and we'll hold you to account. And this is good and transparent and wonderful and utterly culturally specific and utterly inappropriate in many, many contexts. It is, it is good and German and the German Parliament is beautifully transparent, but I don't think it will work in every cultural situation. Um, Harold Macmillan, when, when Harold Macmillan was asked about what, what he feared as a politician, his, the, the great quote is, events, dear boy, events. Things change for politicians. They change every day, every week. We certainly change in five years' time. And what if they were having to be confronted by every single event? interest group coming up to them, presenting them with their shopping list of things that they want to, what the beekeepers want, what the bicyclists want, what the, the, the bee hunters want, what the archaeologists want. It, and especially when you think about individual elected members for the European Parliament or elsewhere, they just don't have the resources to, to accommodate this. So I do think it's lovely. I fear that it might not be very practical. And then the, the last model that I've, I've seen and would like to talk about. At the Society for American Archaeology's annual meeting this year, 2018, it was in Washington, D.C. in the spring. And what SAA set up was a, a mechanism and a route for individual members of the society who were at the conference to then have access to their elected members, their elected representatives at the, on Capitol Hill, and to SAA with their government, um, I forget what David Lindsay's job title is, but SAA has a member of staff who's responsible for political engagement and supporting the, the society, was able to provide people with a, with a briefing, with, with handouts with suggestions on what to speak to your representatives about. And, you, and I, I went along to one of those briefings, it was great. I didn't have a representative to go and speak to, but the briefing was fantastic. <coughs> the important thing Dave was pointing out, the SAA things, is yes, of course, it is good to go and talk to the politicians. What the politicians want to hear is they want to hear nice things. They want to be flattered. They want to be told, they want to be reminded about something they had done that we think is good. Oh yeah, yeah, we appreciate that, we appreciate we've done that, and the politicians like that, and they like having their egos flattered, and they, this is the way to get in and convince them. And, and now, of course, this is only at an individual rather than mass level, but individual votes are all the only votes that they, they have. And so I think that the SAA's model, again, it was very culturally specific, and it was very appropriate for this year, when the membership were right there, and they, they could get on the metro and go and meet their representatives. But I thought it was a, an impressive and effective model. So that's my the third of the three routes that I want to think about. 
So, final thoughts and another miserable poem to finish this off with. The, as I was discussing at uh, lunch with a couple of friends who are not in the room, so I'll still record from my presentation, we talked about archaeology as political influencers. And the position is, ah, there you are, <laughs> the and we may be few, but we are weak. So we, we, we when, what, what they, when the, the views we're trying to change, um, they may be many and they may be strong. That we, there are no actual mass movements within archaeology that can be motivated to, to be out on the streets. The, we don't have the political and financial capital to, to change minds, because let's be cynical. Um, a person standing in the back of the room taught me in one of his presentations or one of his, his articles that there are no political issues that cannot be overturned without, with, without spending sufficient money. Spend enough money and any political decision can be overturned. And the, sometimes the forces that we are campaigning, we are campaigning against, they have those resources. The, the thing that is most important to politicians, and these are the decision makers that we're talking about, the most important thing to them is being re-elected. And that's what matters to every politician, with the exception of uh, members of the British House of Lords and British members of the European Parliament. Everyone else will have to be re-elected at some point. And so they, they care about getting re-elected and they cannot, they cannot focus on a single, single narrow political issue. They, they need to be doing things that are going to please as many people as possible, as much of the time as possible. So we have to be aware of this. Now, this doesn't mean that what we're doing is utterly pointless. What we are able to do is to get in and put thoughts in people's minds, make people aware and remember that, oh yeah, archaeology, I was talking about that, I was hearing about that cultural heritage, yeah, this is a good thing, yeah, that seems like a, a pretty easy way, and I can take that off. But we, we are not going to Nothing that we've spoken about is actually going to was a, a, a sweeping change. What we can do is uh, be, be careful and think hard about what we're doing and how we do it. And we can change some minds. And this is how the world ends. But we can change some minds and we can have some influence for the better for archaeology as a thing and as a practice. <laughs>